You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Did Chris Getz watch Chris Flexen start that game, get to the rain delay, and just say, that's it, I'm signing Mike Clevenger because we don't have enough pitching? Like, was that like a, all right, after what I just saw, I I need another pitcher? It felt like that's what happened. It felt like Flexen was so bad, and you have to take his spring as well and his history as a pitcher. And then the fact that the White Sox look like they're never going to win a game early on this season. I mean, they did win the next night, but it must have looked bleak. And a frustrated new general manager, and he finally was just like, whatever, sign Clevenger or bring him back. Like, that's what it felt like. It felt, like, everybody's asking, like, what is Clevenger going to do because he doesn't have any ability to be traded? Because, like, they put him on waivers last year and nobody wanted to pick him up. And he's not part of your long-term future and you have all these young arms. Like, what is he there for? I think he's the, uh, Flexen's terrible, we need somebody else to eat innings. Good innings, too. Not like Tukey innings or Brad Keller innings, but innings from a guy who performed last year. That's what I think he is. Well, and and why wouldn't he be? I mean, you signed Chris Flexen because he was cheap, and a couple of years ago, he was a guy that pitched a contact and eight innings and you know did some things for the Mariners that helped the back end of their rotation. But, you know, it doesn't mean that he's any darn good. And you went through all of spring training really not having anyone seize that from Flex and other than Nick Destrini, who is going to be part of the rotation, right? He's already he's already a part of the rotation. You're just playing the waiting game with him to get that, that extra year of control. So, yeah, it, it, Chris Flexen isn't part of your long-term plans. He was never part of your long-term plans, which is why when people are like, well, the White Sox are rebuilding. Yeah, but Chris Flexen isn't part of a rebuild. Chris Flexen is a guy. He's a name that you swap out, okay? His name plate on his locker is probably in pencil. They are probably erasing it right now and just handwriting <laughs> in Mike Clevenger with a cramp. Okay, that's what they're doing. Right. I think when Clevenger is ready, he replaces Flexen. I think Nestrini is still coming, and I and I think that your top three guys, or the three guys I know are staying in the rotation at least for now, are going to be Crochet and Soroka and Fetty. And then you'll have Nestrini, and then you'll have Clevenger. I think that's how this thing is going to go. And if you're frustrated because you don't like Mike Clevenger, one, I'm not going to make a whole show about it because we already did this a year ago. That's It's crazy. What has changed in the last year on anybody's feelings about Mike Clevenger? Other than it's a, it's a year later and you've already seen him on this team. So there you go. Right. I will point you, though to something that sits pinned on the top of our X account or Twitter account, whatever you want to call it. You can pin something right now. If you go to that app and you click on our profile, you'll see our nice picture out front at Cork and Carry at the park, the official sponsor of Socks in the Basement, award-winning burgers and ballpark favorites on the menu, the incredible food, the incredible bar, the incredible selections, craft beers from all over the South Side, All your familiar favorites, your spirits, your wines, pregame, bring the whole family in there. Start the party early, get them fed, then get over to the ballpark. Postgame, it's a party, win or lose. I guarantee it was live there on Tuesday night after they got their first win of the season. All summer long, there is no better place to be than over at the Cork at 33rd in Princeton. See everything they have going on at CorkandCarry.com. And Socks in the Basement, on the top of our thing, we pinned a tweet that I think will never leave the pinned tweet section because it will be true until the day he dies. And the pinned tweet is, in the middle of all the White Sox chatter today, just remember the root cause of all pain is Jerry Reinsdorf. And you can use that for everything. You can use that for the start. You can use that for why Chris Getz is shopping in the Mike Clevenger section of the pitcher store. because. Some owners force GMs to reason and say, okay, well, you know, Major League Baseball didn't suspend him and he wasn't charged. And so, yeah, I mean, I know there's this dark cloud around him. And if I had money, I wouldn't even shop in his section. But Michael Lorenzen took $4 million to go play for a contender, and we have a bad reputation, which gets us talked about all around the league. And my owner won't let me shop in the big boy section because he's cutting salary. 
because that's what he did, even though he's trying to tell you he wants to compete. Jerry Reinsdorf cut salary this year and cut expenses, and a general manager starts to reason with himself, all right, I'm going to give him $3 million because we're already giving him four after he opted out, so I'll give him another three and $3 million in incentives. That's a $10 million thing. Four of it we already were paying. He's all that's available. He was a three and a half B war. We know he wasn't bad in our clubhouse last year. We'll bring him in. And if you think that that's exclusive to the White Sox, I will point you to a team that's out of the gate 5-0 and o, at the end of a rebuild that should be spending money that is not in the city of Pittsburgh because the Pirates have a young, exciting team and should have gone out and spent money with the big boys. Their owner is valued at about $4, $4 billion, I want to say, according to Forbes a couple years ago. He's right next to Jerry Reinsdorf. Like, they're both, like, on the on the owner list of personal worth. Reinsdorf and Bob Nutting are, like, right next to each other on the list in Forbes, at least the last time that I saw their list get put out of, of Major League Baseball owners, Right. And that guy's doing the same thing with his team as Jerry Reinsdorf is. He throws nickels around like they're manhole covers. So the general manager out in Pittsburgh, Ben Charrington, when needing to add pitching because he's young, good pitching, much like how Chris Getz has guys down there like Nestrini and some of these other names that we know are going to get here probably halfway through the season and hopefully are ready to go in 2025 when you're turning this team around. He doesn't have the stopgap. So he went out and got Domingo Herman. And he had to go shop in the same section as Mike Clevenger was in. The guy who's tainted, the guy who you really feel icky. You're like, ah, do I really want to put this guy on my team? He went shopping there because his owner wouldn't give him money to go shop at another location. So he goes shopping in that location and he brings in a guy with documented domestic violence. There was a whole thing where his wife was like, we've made up and he was drinking a lot. And then he went out and had like that huge game. It was a no hitter or a perfect game or whatever it was like that for the Yankees. But then he was off the team because he was supposedly drunk in the clubhouse and causing trouble. And it's like, we're going to give this guy a chance and we're going to sign him to a deal because we need to find pitching and my owner won't pay for it. And then I think 24 hours after the Pirates signed him, he was in an article telling somebody that he doesn't think he's an alcoholic because he's learned how to drink without getting out of control. So he has it under control, so he still drinks. And I think every Pirates fan rolled their eyes and said, why do we have this guy? And there's another problem coming down the road, I'm sure. So you're not the only fan base dealing with this. General managers who have to start reasoning with themselves about why they're picking somebody up, they do so because, and I'll go back to it, The root cause of all pain on this team is Jerry Reinsdorf. And so that's why Chris Getz has to shop there. So if you're angry, you can be annoyed with the general manager and why the team is it. But always point everything at the owner because he's the guy setting the budget. And here's a guy in Getz. I get him, right? I don't know if I'd make the same decision as he made here. But if he's backed into a corner and he's like, man, I really don't want to lose 100 games. My boss told me he expects me to do better than this. I have to go find a pitcher. This is all I can get with the money that I'm allowed and the pool of of pitchers willing to come to this complete bleep show that is the White Sox in 2024 that don't have enough players, don't have enough hitters, aren't going to give enough run support. There are pitchers who probably are like, yeah, I would rather take a little bit less than go someplace else. And that's why you had to wait until the season started to get Mike Clevenger. I get it. Because Getz is probably a guy who's sitting there thinking to himself, wait a minute, I'm changing the culture. I'm going to win more than this. And it doesn't look that way right now. So he's sitting in the middle of a terrible start by Chris Flexen. He's looking at the way things are going. He's looking at his manager, who it feels like when he does try to make a move, it's not the right move all the time. He's probably like, eventually I'm going to have to get rid of this guy. And we got problems that I didn't want to get out of the gate this way. And he pulled the trigger on something he probably went back and forth on for weeks. That's kind of how I, I might be nuts because I don't know him personally. But that's kind of how I see that move. In the end, you brought in a pitcher that immediately becomes one of your top three pitchers, statistically. And he's going to eat innings and he's going to pitch well for you, you would expect. That's what you ended up doing. And people ask why. I don't think it's because they think they can flip him. I think he's replacing Chris Flexing because they need an innings eater and they want somebody who produces better than what they saw in that game. And that's why the deal was made during the game, I think. That all tracks, doesn't it? I mean, because if, if the White Sox were sitting there saying, okay, we're planning on competing, we want to identify pitchers that we think can help that. Uh, Eric Fetty might have been signed to a longer than than a, than a two-year deal, right? And you might have sat there and, and and we might have heard more about Mike Soroka being extended, and, and that could be on Soroka's camp entirely. I, I don't know. But you also might have heard more chatter about the White Sox throwing a lot more money at somebody like Jordan Montgomery or throwing a lot of money at a, a free agent pitcher that is going to be part of their plans for the foreseeable future for the next few years as they 
get past this little blip here where they got to extra excise all of the Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams bad and start to bring in some good. And you can't do that all in one off season when the free agent market isn't, isn't really good enough to support that. Let alone when Jerry Reinsdorf isn't going to let you spend the kind of money you need to spend. So yeah, I think if you're Chris Getz, you've had Mike Clevenger's phone number and you've had some sort of handshake agreement. Like, yeah, we do this. And Clevenger's camp is probably sitting there going, you know, absent anything else, nobody else is calling me. I, I would do this just because he wants to get on the mound and he wants to prove himself again that he can he can still pitch. You would have thought that would happen last year. But in the middle of it, yeah, he's looking at Chris Flexen. He's looking at this team start off this poorly. And, you know, you can sit there and say, but Crochet kept him in the game. Soroka kept him in the game. Fetty kept him in the game. There were good things that happened from those starts. Chris Flexen was a disaster. And he wasn't good in spring training. It's not like he came out and he just kind of fell on his face. It's not. Here's a guy who, if you look at his track record and what he's done over the last couple of years and what you saw in the spring, like I, I thought it was surprising when they, they basically christened him one of the starting five before spring training started. We had Merkin on here. But they, they, they had telling, to do that. I was like, I don't, I don't get it. He's not that good. And and so like yeah I think that the I think the move was ultimately made because I I don't think Chris Flexen is long for the team or at least the rotation maybe he slides into a long relief role like what he did for the Mariners and 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 the, maybe maybe that's what he ends up being but I I really I felt that. like I felt like that whole move was just a frustration move by a young general manager well and and, and he's shopping in the Chris Flex I mean you want to talk about having to shop in the wrong aisles okay. Chris Flexen is in the basket at the front of the store with a dent in the can. Right. <laughs> and, and, and like no label on him. Right. It's, this is just sort of like whatever's in here is five bucks. Are these green beans or peas? We don't know. Socks in the basement listeners switch to a new age of life with Hyatt home medical equipment. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living, make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. Or maybe you've had a procedure yourself and you need some equipment to get around the house. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling. They're going to work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals and they do so much for so many people. If you use a CPAP machine, I have so many relatives that use one. If you're unhappy with your vendor, switch now, get supplies directly mailed to you. Plus, you can test out the latest and greatest in their special testing rooms in their showroom here on the South Side. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. Learn all about Hyatt Home Medical Equipment at HHME.com. Meanwhile, if you want to take the temperature of White Sox fans, I want to point to my tiny little social media account on X or Twitter, okay, on my Twitter right. account, because I don't have, I don't use it personally very much. I, I'm an anti-social media guy. In fact, a lot of the social media that gets put out, with the exception of the Socks of the Basement accounts, because my social media manager admittedly doesn't know very much about the team, or at least to the level that Ed and I talk about it, so she's afraid to put most things out on that. She's like, can you handle the baseball thing? Because... I don't get it the same way that you get it. And I'm like, yeah, sure. But I don't like using social media. And it shows when you see the amount of people that actually follow my personal account because I really don't care very much about it. And I put out a, a tweet from my personal account just because I thought it was funny. And just to give you an idea, this account has less than a thousand followers and most of them are probably dead. Like my personal account is not something that I use. I don't tweet out on it or anything like that. And I saw Daryl Van Scowen put out a tweet from the White Sox. Sox have traded right-handed pitcher Jake Cousins to the Yankees in exchange for cash considerations. And all I did was retweet it and say, and I quote, the White Sox will be selling one player per home series for cash until you start buying more campfire milkshakes. Now that's a cute little joke, right? It is. It resonated so much with White Sox fans in the first two days it had 52,000 views. <laughs> From an account oh my God. that has less than a thousand followers because it was getting shared like crazy. That tells you the temperature of the White Sox. My little stupid little account resonated more, I think, in the White Sox social media landscape than anything that was tagged with better at the ballpark. Because that's how Sox fans react to this team. The biggest story of this team 
in the first four, five, six days is that they have a milkshake that's a big giant s'more. That you can get at the ballpark. That's the, right. That's the bit. You have Luis Robert Jr.'s two home run day that was wasted. Garrett Crochet could be legit a top end starter after his first two starts of the year and campfire milkshakes. That's the White Sox in 2024 early on. This is not going well for them. And, and I put out a poll asking, do you blame the construction of the team or do you blame the manager? And I, I saw it very evenly split among Sox fans where like half of the fans were like, yeah, none of this is on Pedro. This team is terrible. And half of them were like, he probably cost them at least one game so far. And if he did cost them a game, I think I would point to the 7-6 loss of game two. And that goes back to what we talked about in the last episode when I was like, look, he's not going to have a massive impact over 162, but it's the little things that you need a manager to do and do right that's going to change you from a team that loses 100 games and a team that might win 10 more or be interesting this summer. And I think that the biggest mistake he made in that game was you don't have a lot of offense. I think it's very obvious. You're going to see it even more now with a loy out. And you took one of your few bats that are reliable in Andrew Vaughn and you pinch ran for him. And in the end, then here comes Gavin Sheets eventually. And there was a moment where you could have used that hit and I think it's far less likely you're going to get it from Gavin Sheets. And I've seen Gavin Sheets up at the plate a couple times now with a left-handed pitcher against him. And some of that's roster construction and some of that is Pedro making decisions. And so I am not pinning every game on him and he may not be the loss, but I will tell you this. If you get six runs with this team, your manager better find a way to pull the right levers with your bullpen to get you the victory in the end. That's how I felt about that game. The other game's fine. You're not put together right. There's not much a manager can do. Heck, you may actually be able to say that the game on Tuesday night, he won for you with a move when he pinch hits DeYoung and they take the lead on that home run. You score six runs, you get two home runs from Luis Robert Jr. and you lose, I'm looking at Pedro. I don't care if people think that's irrational or not. That's the guy I'm looking at. Well, and, and again, if you're going to if you're going to do this where you're not going to put together a team of all-stars, okay, and and Lord knows, they're not going to be able to put together a team of all-stars, and no team really does that except for maybe the Dodgers, right? But even the Dodgers have problems, right? They're, they're saddled with whatever Gavin Lux is out there for them, and they're, they're gnashing of teeth because Mookie Betts has to play shortstop now because they couldn't find a shortstop this offseason. So you have always are going to have a manager – who needs to make the right decisions based on the personnel he has. And this is why I point to Pedro and why I will point to any White Sox manager. All right. It's magnified when you have a team that is constructed like this, where there's not a lot of guys out there that have the natural talent or, you know, and, and, and especially because this is not a team of rookies. It's a team of veteran castoffs. Like Paul DeYoung looks like what, what Paul DeYoung's looked like for a couple of years, which isn't good. Okay. Yeah, Nikki Lopez is what he is right now. Nikki Lopez looks like what we kind of expected Nikki Lopez to look like. And when you do have young guys like Dominic Fletcher, I understand why they're giving Dominic Fletcher a chance. All, all he had to do was throw that guy out at third. And, and I'm like, okay, I understand why they're putting this guy in the outfield and they're going to let him hit his way on. Braden Shoemake steals a run for you. That could be important in the right context on the right team where a manager is going to take advantage of stuff like that. You know, and take advantage of a kid who's got nothing to lose and he's just out there. He's going to do his, his darndest to stay on a major league roster from now on. And there, there's there's some value to a guy like that or Corey Lee hitting a home run, even though he looked like garbage in some of his other at bats. But everything else, we, we are, is anybody shocked Gavin Sheets isn't hitting? No, because we've watched him for a couple of years. This is what he does. He doesn't hit. He hits Even in spring training. We said that. He, We're like, right, oh, this he, is spring training, Gavin. And he contributed a little bit to that win that they have on Tuesday night because he's not the worst player in the world. He's just not an everyday player. Yeah, he hits in spring training. He doesn't hit in the regular and he, season. And he started to fall off as the rosters were contracted in the last couple of weeks. You saw his stats going down because he was playing against a higher level of talent more, more often than not exactly. when he was up at the plate. I mean, like, here's the thing. We as fans who watch this team, you, I, those of you listening right now, we know who these guys are. This exactly. is new to us. We we know what we have. What I would like to actually see them do right now, I know it's crazy, but I, I look at a Braden Shoemake and I go, ah, you know what? He's he's out there. He's hustling. Put him in the lineup every day because you got to do something. Find a win. 
It would, you know, if if Corey Lee at least is every once in a while able to run into one, that's better than what Maldonado can do. Find find something, do something to switch it up. Again, it goes back to why Getz did what he did, in my opinion. Whether or not you liked it or not, I mean, he did add a pitcher with a really with a pretty solid B WAR that's going to be better than the guy he's probably replacing in Flexen. And he's saying, I got to make some kind of change. I mean, you see the A's doing it. The A's took a very young center fielder that they really like in Estuary Ruiz. And after three games, sent him back to AAA. He was hitting 429 when they sent him down. He had a 1232 OPS over those three games. He was actually hitting the ball. He'd only struck out once. And they said, well, there's something we told him to work on in spring training. He's still not doing it. We're not putting up with this garbage for 162. That's the A's. The A's are showing accountability right away. So that's what I'm watching here early on. Where's the accountability? I get why they're afraid to put Jimenez on the IL because they don't have enough hitters in the lineup and they're hoping he's better. But this injury he has last time took him two weeks. And, you know, we all know what's going to happen. It's going to be three, four days of him being day-to-day while Lenin Sosa sits here in Chicago getting cold after a hot start in the minors. And he's ready to be placed on the roster. Or anybody can be placed on the roster. You're going to play short. And we all know three days from now or four days from now, you're finally going to put him on the IL after you played three, four games short. It's the same story all the time with this team. It's brutal. We know who the players are. We know where your shortcomings are in your decision-making process sometimes. I'm watching it happen again right now. I get why you want him to stick around. I get why you're hopeful that all of a sudden he's going to make a miraculous recovery and you can get him back in there and he's going to be productive, but most likely he's not. He's going to be damaged. So just put him on the IL and bring somebody else in. I, that's all I want right now. I, I, I cannot expect them to win more games than they lose the way that they're constructed and with the manager they currently have. I would like accountability, and if you're not good enough, get out of the way because there's somebody else who's ready for a shot. That's what I want to see all season long, and it's not too early to do that right now. No, and and getting back to it with the manager, some of that has to come in what's going on in the lineup on a daily basis, who you're putting out there, and and I don't think that Getz has that kind of control. I don't think he's trying to exert that kind of control over that. I'm not even entirely sure that Chris Getz is the decision maker behind not putting Aloy on the IL, and and he may be relying on Pedro's assessment of the situation. Oh, and that, that'd be crazy! That, that'd be crazy. Pedro's it, not it a doctor. Be. In the end, the buck has to stop with Getz. If Getz isn't making that decision, I don't, I don't what he's not going to quit his job, but he shouldn't be there anymore. I expect my general manager when he doesn't have a Kenny Williams above him because that was the thing. That was the problem. There were too many voices in the room. He needs to be the solo voice making the choice. Unless he's setting Pedro up to fail, but I don't think you need to set up Pedro to fail. I don't, I don't think, I don't think you need to do very much work to be able to justify firing this guy. No, I don't think so. But Pedro's going to have to, he's got to put guys in a position to succeed too. Right. And, and putting Gavin sheets into a situation where he's going to have to face a left-handed batter because you've decided that you needed a pinch run for Andrew Vaughn, who isn't fast, but he's not exactly like. And you didn't do so anything. Slow. No, no, but here's the thing: you didn't do anything when you brought Pilar in. He stood there on the base, and you did nothing. So what was the point? Exactly, because you're not getting an extra base hit that Pilar is going to take that extra base that Vaughn wasn't going to take. Right. I mean, that was the stupidest part about making the move. You're like, oh, oh, Andrew Vaughn, a little bit slower than Kevin Pilar. I got to look like I'm doing something. So you make the move. You take one of your better bats out of the lineup. And you didn't even do anything with the pinch runner. See, that's why. Right. I mean, though it's those it's those little things. Somebody will sit there and say, "Oh, did that really change the game?" Well, they do make differences these decisions. And again, when I look at six runs on that second game of the season, and you get two home runs from Luis Robert Jr. and you 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 should be you should be able to finish that game off. You really you got to be. Yes. Able, that's on the manager more than the players. They got a win, though, on Tuesday. They finally got their first win. I feel like they should be 2-3 and three right now. It's a long season. It'll be interesting to keep track of how many games Pedro wins for you and how many he loses for you. In fact, right now I'll say he lost game two of the season, but his decisions helped you win the first game of the year. I'm going to put him at an even zero, and I think I'm being kind. If you would be so kind as to support Sox in the Basement, We've got a few things on the website that you can do that will support this show. First of all, the best options, the best deals, the best incentives for all the sports books in whatever state you're listening in. 
are available at SocksInTheBasement.com. Take advantage of one of them. You win, we win. There's also our brand new Vouch Store. Support some small businesses. Camp Craft Cocktails makes you a professional bartender at home. Split Rock Coffee supports veterans. See it all at SocksInTheBasement.com. Back to the Pedro issue of, you know, one, are you putting the right pitchers in the right situation? We have seen a couple of occasions, and you can quibble with why Tim Hill is here with Chris Getz and, and what he was what he was envisioning Hill would be able to bring to the table, but there's two situations where Pedro brings in Tim Hill, knowing that Hill is going to either A, face a right-hander because they're going to pinch hit for the guy that's up at the plate, or B, he's going to have to, once he gets that lefty out, there's righties behind him, all right? There is no doubt that anybody who has ever for a second looked at Tim Hill's baseball card or watched him throw one pitch with that motion understands that righties are going to eat him up, and all they're going to do is just, all they have to do is take a single back up the middle. It's not rocket science. But again, is Pedro putting Tim Hill in a position to succeed, or could you get by with one of your right-handed pitchers pitching to Colt Keith, who's a rookie who's geeked up because he's making his debut, he took, just signed a huge contract, and he's probably going to pop out anyway because his adrenaline is through the roof. You're not putting guys in a position to succeed. If you're going to put Kevin Pillar on first base and take out your starting first baseman, you got to steal a base, right? You got to at least run and try. If Pillar had gotten thrown out there, I would have been like, well, you know what? With the rules, with the you know the pitchers not being able to engage, Pilar could get a running start. It doesn't matter. Good idea. Pinch run for a guy that's a little bit faster. It's a little bit more of a base stealer. Doing something to try and invent offense. But I've seen so far a lot of the decision making of just let me put a guy in here because it seems like I should put a guy in here. I should do something. Okay. The lineup changes every day because I feel like I should try and do something. And it's not, there's got to be a point to all of this. At least with Mike Clevenger, we understand like, okay, this is a better pitcher than what was run out against the Braves. And this guy who was run out against the Braves probably doesn't deserve to be on a major league roster, which is why he was in the dented can bin at the front of the pitching store anyway. So gets at least I can see a little bit of something there. And we've talked all off season. We can see a little bit of something of a vision. Pedro has got to show us that he has a vision for how games are won and not just how culture is, is won. He, he can win the culture wars all he wants in the dugout. But I still think even though managers by and large are awash throughout the year, you still have to show me that you have a vision for how games are actually won. And, and, and this team is not going to figure that out in a vacuum. They don't have a guy right now that you can sit there and go, but this guy can tell us how to win games. I know Martin Maldonado has been on some really good Astros teams, but I'm not sure he's the guy to tell everyone this is how we win games. And it shouldn't come from your starting who should be your backup catcher anyway. Okay. There's just, it, it, it's not a thing where teams pull themselves up by the bootstraps. General managers can bring together guys that he thinks can click and win. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be watching to see, does Pedro seem to have a vision for how to win a game or is he just putting guys in based on it seems like it's this guy's turn to come out of the bullpen. I got a slow guy on first. I should put a fast guy on first. What are you going to do with him? That's the problem. That's the problem. Right. That's where the vision is. Right. Okay? And, and that's, that's the issue. The issue is that he, you're right. He doesn't seem to have a cohesive plan as to how he's going to win baseball games. Like I don't see a White Sox way out there. Win or lose. No. I don't see a White Sox way. This is a team that's going to run on you. This is a team that's going to do this in certain situations. I don't see it right now. I just see them marching out a pretty basic lineup. Again, I look at what the Dodgers do. That's a team that you can hold up any team as a standard to the Dodgers. Otani, Betts, and Freeman, they're big three hitters. They also hit in the top three spots in the order every day. Right. right? To maximize the amount of times that they go to the plate to give them the highest impact on your offense and to go after a starting pitcher immediately before they get comfortable. That's a gold standard team in Major League Baseball for the amount of talent that they have. And that's how they operate. And I just see I see a lineup that I think a little kid could come up with when he's playing Stratomatic Baseball or some video game or something like that. Well, let's go with a guy who's got some time playing leadoff, and then let's find like somebody who's not like the best hitter, but you know, a little speedy, kind of shorter. Like, you know, something like that. And then we'll go put our big three hitters in the middle. And then I don't know who's protecting the five guy. I mean, it, it 
it, it really is a paint by numbers lineup. And I don't see him operating it in a way where I'm like, oh, well, now I get why he's doing it this way. Instead, I see these half decisions. It was a half decision with the Pilar coming in in that game. I don't want to hamper on it forever, but it, it was a half decision. And I need to see full decisions. And I think it'll be very interesting to watch how the White Sox operate over the next couple of months because they're not calling it a rebuild. But who's going to get playing time here if they if they lose another, let, let's say they lose like, you know, five out of the next eight, which is possible. Which is likely. Man, what, 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 who's, what are you going to do with this team then at that point? How are you how are you going to how are you going to operate your team? Do you let Pedro run this team all year? Is is Grady Sizemore major league baseball coach who doesn't have a title really the guy who all of a sudden it's like, guess what? We're getting rid of Pedro and we're moving people around and now he gets a title. I mean, I said it I said it months ago that Pedro's the fall guy. Oh yeah. And and yeah. does he need to be the guy that goes the entire year? Does Getz get to walk in and tell the owner, like, hey, look at this terrible start we had. I did all these things. I got grindy players and we're playing defense and we're changing this and I kept it under budget for you, Uncle Jerry. And I didn't I didn't waste your money as this guy over here and I didn't hire him. Right. Yeah, this wasn't my decision, but don't worry. Pedro Grafol is obsessed with turning the White Sox around. That was a headline the other day. Don't worry about it. He's obsessed. Uh, don't, oh, he's obsessed. Right. <laughs> he's obsessed with it. You better uh, be obsessed with it. That's your job. Yes. <laughs> You're not impressing me with saying that out loud. You better be obsessed with it. All right? You better be. Just being obsessed with something doesn't mean it's going to work out for you, though. Okay? No. Yeah. And being obsessed with doing your job right. correctly is not an obsession. That's that's an obligation. <laughs> Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.